one of the greatest experiences that I've had with the club so far, and it sounds glib, but it's true, was going to Vegas with him after, <laughs> after we won the, the final, uh, or after we won the league, because it was my first opportunity. I went there with Caitlin, uh, my wife, and, and the club, and there was no management team. There was no, it, it was just the boys. My guest today is a multi-talented actor, writer, director, the creative mind who co-imagined both Mythic Quest and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The latter, ensuring Danny DeVito will one day be dipped in bronze and enshrined in the Smithsonian where he truly belongs. In November 2020, he teamed with Ryan Reynolds to buy Wrexham AFC, an astonishingly surreal at the time takeover that leaves the two of them tied as the world's second most handsome football club owners right behind Arsenal, Stan Kroenke. Their creative leadership has coaxed an international audience to experience the challenges, successes, and frankly, the shared humanity of this incredible football club as he's delivering on his promise to help Wrexham become a global force. We're about to watch his Welsh poet warriors take the field in his magnificent hometown of Philadelphia. It's an incredible time to welcome Mr. Rob McElhenney. Thank you, Raj. Good to be here. Oh, Rob, we are here in Philadelphia, your hometown, Wrexham, playing away. What does it feel like? Is it a bit like showing the person you married your childhood bedroom? I'm happy to answer that question, but I have to address something first because I'm sure anybody that's watching this is thinking about this. You and I did not coordinate our outfits together, correct? We normally do. I just, on a, normally we yeah. do, but on, a, on, on match day, we try not to talk, right? Yes, that's true. I walked in the store, and the first thing I saw, you have a, a white undershirt and a purple shirt. Yeah. And it just so happens that I'm wearing the same. I know. I have the same chest hair arrangement, though, and I'm very envious. Yeah. Well, well we can really. work on that. I got, really. I, got, I got people for that. And, but and you know what? That's another conversation for another day. Okay. Oh, but Philadelphia. <laughs> Wrexham. Yes. Childhood bedroom. It's just been uh, an amazing and, and profound experience from the very beginning, but especially to come home. I was just in my hotel room. I was l looking down. I can see my high school from my, my, um, my hotel window. And it, I, for whatever reason, it was a surreal experience for me this morning. And I was really, um, uh, really contemplative as I sat there and, and was dreaming about what tonight was going to be like. It's like a rosebud moment. Well... I'd like to think I'm not going to per perish uh, but at the end of this. I hope this is not a rosebud moment. Oh. You know he, that he dies when I he know, says rosebud. Rob, I'm just getting started, Raj. All, I don't like to beat the bad news. We're all going to die, and God At speed. some point. But, uh, can we, let me move from death to just how good is this Stoke coffee? Oh, the, 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 I just have to, have to say the Stoke cold brew coffee is amongst the most delicious cold brew coffees in the world. Oh. So good. They named it after a famous football stadium. Rob, we're talking, as Wrexham wrap-up, two remarkable weeks going coast to coast in the United States. Just capped off really an astounding two years for this club. This summer alone has seen Wrexham supporters setting alarms so they could go online to score one of the team's new kits before they sold out like that. Fans braving North Carolina's broiling temperatures to try and get on goalkeeper Ben Foster's GoPro. Wayne Jones, the owner of now famed Turf Hotel, walking around the stadium, mobbed as if he was Harry Bloody Styles. Tell me, this is exactly what you imagined when you took over this club less than three years ago, that you would be facing Chelsea and Manchester United and chopping it up with Eric Ten Hag. Um. Well, no. I would say that, that <laughs> the specific events that have transpired, uh, I don't think anybody could have predicted. Um, but we knew from the very beginning uh, that this had the potential to happen. Uh, again, we didn't know what the timeline would be. Um, but we knew that if we told the story right, um, that we would be able to touch people in a way that, that uh, would motivate them to be doing exactly what they're doing right now. We're going to talk more about that and exactly why, you know, the match that has really lit this tremendous fire locally and globally. But we need to acknowledge, um, I, hang on, I'm going to, what did you say to Eric Ten Hag before the game? The Manchester United manager, the ball, the guy, you sure can. Oh, yeah. I said, good luck. I said, it, it was an honor to be here. <laughs> uh, truly, it, it was an honor um, and a pleasure. 
to play Manchester United. They are uh, a story club and I, I believe the most popular sports club in the world, uh, transcending sport. So it was an honor for us to even be on the pitch with them. I like English into Miami, but pre-season is a time for hope. It's also a time of challenge too. Football can give you such highs. It can give you unexpected sucker punches. And we need to say up top, I'm so sorry about Paul Mullin. It's very clear how deeply you care about the players as footballers, but as human beings. And when an injury like that happens, can you describe the emotions that you experienced? It's devastating. You know, growing up a sports fan, and I've been a sports fan my entire life, it's easy to think of the players as characters in a story that you're watching on television. Even if you happen to meet some of them over the course of time, if you don't really understand who they are as human beings, it's hard not to feel a distance. And I no longer feel that. I've spent a lot of time with these men, um, both professionally and personally. I know them very well. I know their families very well. I know their children, their parents, some of their grandparents. Um, and so we're, we're incredibly close. So this isn't just a striker getting hurt. Uh, this is my friend. This is somebody who I have a, a, a deep personal connection with who has to have um, an ambulance come and take him to the hospital. So then you have to compartmentalize to a certain extent because you have to move on with the game. But I'm constantly on my phone checking for updates. And luckily, Paul had his phone. <laughs> and Paul was checked back in with us within a, a few hours. And he's going to be returning to Wrexham in about two weeks well, with, first, a, with a Scouse Californian accent, no doubt. Yeah, first, so right now he's, uh, he's not allowed to leave the, uh, the San Diego area, but then he's going to come and stay with us, uh, with Caitlin and I, in Los Angeles, just because he doesn't have any friends or family here. So, um, and we didn't want him to be alone and so lonely. So he's going to come stay with us at the house. Uh, I'm going to go to the UK for the game. Caitlin's going to stay back <laughs> so that he's not alone. And my one kid's going to come with me, one kid's going to stay back because he'd rather sp spend time with Paul than with me. Paul, Paul. And then I come back uh, from the game and, and then it'll be the Brady Bunch. I don't know. Super Paul Mullen is essentially going to be your money for two weeks. I think it'll be the other way around. But, <laughs> but, um, but yes, yes, he's our, he's, he's, he's our friend and we just don't want him to be alone in San Diego. One quick fascinating detail about this tour, I joke with Phil Parkinson, your manager, that it can't be long now until Wrexham sign an American player, as they now can as a football league team. Have you given any thought, tiny amount of thought, about signing a bona fide American to follow in the footsteps of the club's legendary first ever US star, Manchester born, New Jersey raised, Jake Edwards, played all of 11 games for Wrexham. I would say that I don't dream of these things. I I listen to, to Phil, and if Phil says this is the player that I want, then we go after that person 100%, truly. We don't know enough about sports, any sport, let alone football, to be even dreaming of making those decisions. So even this morning as we were talking about signing a, a few new players before the season, it comes back from the board, this is who we're thinking, and Ryan and I both respond the same way. Is this who Phil wants? Well, do our best to go get him. Does Phil really want Landon Donovan was the question that you asked yourself. I don't know. Who knows? I Phil. guess we'll find out. Phil, he loves people in bull denial. Rob, I want to talk about your own football journey because you didn't grow up supporting a soccer club or even downing half-time orange slices at a YMCA youth team. Story's well told, but you started watching games in the Mythic Quest writer's room with Wrexham's now executive director, Humphrey Kerr, after watching both seasons of Sunderland Till I Die, the exquisite Netflix series about Sunderland's traumatic fall. And so you decided to charge headfirst into this sport, truly, madly, deeply. And according to Wrexham's former director, Spencer Harris, you quote, searched all of Western Europe for the right club. Was there a specific moment or incident that made it clear to you that screamed out Wrexham, Wrexham, the chosen one? Oh, most definitely. Um, it was when we started to see uh, images of the people of Wrexham and started uh, reading the lore and listening to the stories and understanding the history. It, it's a mining town. It just felt like home to me. The people look like people I grew up with, uh, family members, friends, the people that uh, you see around this city every day. And that resonated with me. And I know it did with Ryan as well, who grew up in a, in a working class neighborhood. It was down to a, f a few other towns as well, because Wrexham is not the only town in the UK that's like that. 
But because of that, um, we also recognized that there was, look, it's sports, so there's always going to be some tribal division, and that's what's fun about it. But I also found and figured that we could find some commonalities amongst the people, especially across the United States, in towns just like Wrexham, just like Philadelphia. And if we could tell the story of Wrexham and people could identify with it, then they would love the club as much as the town did. By the way, at Men in Blazers, we get fans of the show writing to ask us to stop tw tweeting about Wrexham during the season because that anger that we, they're angry that we're spoiler alerting season two of your show as if it was like the final season of Succession, which is genuinely a fascinating and unique tension. But when Wrexham started to rise, you assembled this incredible cast of characters. And as you say, some people wrote it all off as a fad, like a yo-yo or a hula hoop or a grimace shake. But we noticed immediately massive, massive engagement when we talked about Wrexham, tweeted about Wrexham. It was like on par with Premier League content, Messi-like numbers occasionally. I saw what you were doing. I took it super seriously from the beginning. To me, what you're doing in North Wales, it's honestly like watching an epic Greek poem play out in real time. And I want to ask you, how do you understand the ingredients that have led to Wrexham becoming essentially the world's biggest, smallest global powerhouse football club? Um, well, I think what Ryan and I understand uh, best because it's our, prep, our profession is storytelling. And I think when we looked at Wrexham and we looked at the football pyramid, which was really, for me, that was the moment um, when I was sitting next to Caitlin and we were in the middle of the pandemic and I learned about promotion and relegation. I had never, never learned that before. And, uh, and I, when I, I called Humphrey and he said, of, of course, this, I've been telling you about this for years, you just haven't been listening. <laughs> <laughs> and he was dead right. And I've call, I, feel, I call a, a few of my friends who were, and I'm going to say soccer because we're in the United States, you soccer say, fans. Say whatever you want. And, and, and I said, have you heard of this? And they're like, yes, we have been talking about this for years. Humphrey was probably like, what else have I been telling him for years that he's not listening to? Yes, and that's, that's fair. Um, and so I'm such a, a massive sports fan. I thought, wow. And I, I really, I watched that exquisite documentary, Sunderland Until I Die. And again... I just recognized those people and it was such a beautiful story and you were watching this tragedy unfold uh, of the descent of the club, which makes it uh, inherently compelling. But I thought, well, there's an opportunity to tell the opposite version of that story, which is a story of hope. Instead of taking a club who's at the top, who's tumbling down, we could take a club who's down and try to tell the story of them <laughs> ascending. Uh, and and so I immediately uh, Googled, how do I buy a sports team? And this article in the New York Times came up um, about this man named Steve Horowitz, uh, who works at Inner Circle. <laughs> Inner Circle Sports. And I thought, I don't know. I mean, he did the Liverpool deal. He did the Red Sox. I was going to call him. So I called him. I said, you don't know who I am, but if you have kids, they, they might. Um, this is my plan. This is what I'd like to do. <laughs> he said, I don't know. Let me think about it we kind of handle bigger things and you're talking about something small. And I said, sure. So this is a Friday, I hang up. Saturday morning, I get a text from him from the East Coast. He says, can you call me? As soon as I saw, can you call me? I knew that he was interested. So I called him back and he said, this sounds compelling, I'll help you. And I think what happened at every moment after that, each person that would be brought in, including Ryan, I emailed Ryan one night thinking as this was happening, you know, I might want to find a sponsorship. And Ryan it, obviously owns the gin company, and I thought that could be a fun sponsor. But then I thought, it might be more interesting. He's so entrepreneurial. He would be a great partner. Um, I wonder, wonder if he would want to go into it with me. And I wrote him this email of what the plan was, sent it off in the, at, in, in, before I went to bed at 10 o'clock at night. And uh, I woke up at 5 in the morning, and he had already responded and said, call me. So I called him. And he said, I'm in, just like that. We found Wrexham within a few weeks. Um, and, uh, and then we were off to the races. But for us, it's always been about the same thing, which is that we believe that this story is, is not specific to Wales. It's not specific to the UK or the US or Asia or Africa. It's an inherently human story. And we believe um, that 
anybody and everybody can watch this and see themselves in it. I mean, listening to you, the, the, part of the tragedy, I'm from Liverpool, part of the tragedy of watching Sunderland Till I Die is it's not just the football club that's, uh, that's uh, descending, it's the city, it's mm -hmm. the community uh, that's been left to rot. Mm -hmm. um, so double the echo of the power of what you're doing. It's not just a football club you're lifting up, you're saying a community like Wrexham, which is you know, in the northwest of, uh, of Britain, like Liverpool has really been uh, thrown away politically, socially, economically. You're saying, no, you know, hope can live here, hope can breathe here. I saw a clip um, once of a, a, a woman, that her team had lost and, and she had tears in her eyes and she said, why can't it ever be us? To me, even to, in this moment right now, I get emotional about it because it's not, it's very clearly not about football. Uh, for her. She um, and the people she loves and the community that she loves have been marginalized for almost their entire existence. And I think there are so many people out there that think that the good things in life are not for them and that they're not destined for them. And that is heartbreaking. So you're almost flipping the question around. Why can't it be us? Is Why can't it be you? If it should be you. It can be you. So a huge part of it is that. And by the way, it's not a sports thing, it is a sports thing. Because why can't it be us? I'm an Everton fan, a Chicago Bears fan, a Chicago White Sox fan. And when I watch that, there's many levels of trauma, Sunderland till I die. Part of it is the Robin Ryan effect. You draw an audience who don't care about football, but love you guys. There is the beauty of Wrexham story as you've identified, but for football fans, there's something quite brilliant. There's also the fact that every football fan can support this team. You can support Chelsea and cheer for Wrexham. You can support Barcelona and cheer for Wrexham because they are fourth tier. Unless you're a Notts County fan, your team are non-threatening. Yes. Um, I think that's a, a huge part of the fun too. That, oh, by the way, can I just point out that this is like the most British thing ever? That we, we started to go into an, an emotional place and then immediately my British compatriot got out of it as quickly as possible. And I'm so used to this now because I, I, I'm, I'm spending so much time in the UK and I, I understand it full stop and I appreciate it. He's on to me. Thank you. He's on to me. Um, Re so Repression. Roger is Latin for repression, I think. 100% fair. Um, I, I think this is part of the fun. So we were, when we were at Manchester United, when we were talking with the people of Chelsea, I kept saying to the supporters, <laughs> you can have two clubs. We're so far apart. You can have two clubs. You for can now. support us for now. <laughs> And we got a great response. And I think it was so fascinating to see how many Man U fans, because that game very specifically, were, were wearing uh, Man U kits and Wrexham hats. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a beautiful opportunity. That headspace. We're not in the football business. We're in the headspace business. I'm, we're in the heart business. And the headspace business. Sure, because uh, um, you're British and I'm American. But by the way, no, I've been talking, <laughs> talking about British crap. If you want me to talk about I will talk about British. One of the most amazing facets of this story is how English fans love it too. This is possibly of all the incredible tricks you played, one of the most unfathomable. You pass their smell test, you and Ryan, which is incredibly hard to do. Steve Coogan once said, and I love this, if you give an Englishman the choice between his own success and your failure, He'll choose your failure every single time. You should have been rejected. You should have been spat out like a donor organ. But you've won them over. Well, I wouldn't say we've won everybody over. I, I think we've, I feel, that I feel what you're talking about from time to time. But I thought you were going to be buzzsawed. I thought you were going to be buzzsawed. I really did. I we, we expected you. that. I we, we expected that. Um, but again, I think we just approached everything as honestly as we possibly could. And I know that that often will draw the buzzsaw. Um, but again, I think what we're trying to do, and we've been very diligent in this, and this is also very important to us, is that we knew right away that if we came in there and acted like the Hollywood, the Hollywood jerks who knew what they were talking about, that that would be automatically <laughs> rejected and should be but that it, it wasn't about us coming in and telling people what to do. It's also the beauty of being so naive about it. We just asked as many questions as we could. We asked them what they needed 
and how we could help them as opposed to telling them what we should do, what they should do. As an American sports fan falling in love with football, it's your embroidered Wrexham AFC snapback, which is omnipresent. And until someone orders their Welsh cakes whiz wit, that hat is possibly the ultimate fusion of North Wales and, and South Philadelphia. And I've always wanted to know about the inception idea for this creative flourish, because it is so bloody brilliant. Was it like specially commissioned, like some kind of new era inaugural ball game? So I actually have it with me, which is, I didn't realize you were going to be asking me about it, but I bring had, it everywhere. You put this on the table and it honestly I just, took my breath I away. I, I was felt like, like it, was, it was inappropriate to actually wear it for the interview, but I'll wear it later because it's so hot and sunny. Um, yes, so originally, this is a baseball cap, and they're not, you don't necessarily see them in, in all, all over the UK, you do not see baseball caps, and you certainly don't see them in football. Um, but I knew I wanted to have some kind of merchandise just for myself to, to represent. I live in California, there's a lot of sun, and it's good to always just be walking around if you're wearing it. Anyway, so I thought, well, how can I make something that I would wear um, that, that would look cool and different and didn't exist because we didn't have a robust merchandising arm. Uh, and I, I would even say that we're still not quite there yet uh, with the club. So I just had a couple of hats custom made. And, and I, I actually- that, that was your idea, just go old school NFL, fuse the two. Boom. Yes, and I've already, I've already admitted this to Amy Trask, who was the, uh, the CEO of, of the Raiders back in the day. <laughs> I said, Amy, full stop, I'm an Eagles fan, but what I did was steal the Raiders. Sue me now. Yeah, I stole the Raiders thing. If you remember, like when I was a kid growing up, Lyle, Lyle, you would see, yes, you would see Bad man. Raiders, not even necessarily on baseball caps, but you'd see them, actually, no, the, the band NWA, Ice Cube, when I was a kid growing up, I'd never heard anything like that before. And you saw on the album cover, they just had all black with just white lettering. And it just looked both <laughs> classy and menacing at the same time. I don't know what it is. It's like, it's that old school Raiders look. And I thought we could do something like that here. And it just kind of took off. It's, it, I wear it in the in documentary so people see that. And then we just started making them. And uh, Ryan, Ryan wears a different one. So we have a little bit of a fun rivalry between the two of us of which hats sell more. And through this entire experience, if the question is who's got more, say fame or height or money <laughs> or followers or friends, or charisma, <laughs> or ability, charm. Ryan is the answer to that. Who sold more hats? The answer is Rob. This guy. You do have close involvement with the players. You have built real relationships with them, with their families, with their grandparents in some cases. And an international audience gets to know them and their stories. You've drunken victory beers with them in their locker rooms. You've listened to Steve Aoki remix their chants in Vegas nightclubs. Does having those deeper, more personal connections, does it make it difficult when you do have to start making decisions about the team, about not re-signing someone to a contract or when someone needs to move on? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, one of the greatest experiences that I've had with the club so far, and it sounds glib, but it's true, was going to Vegas with them after, <laughs> after we won the, the final uh, or after we won the league because it was my first opportunity. I went there with Caitlin, uh, my wife, and, and the club. And there was no management team. There was no, it was just the boys, just the young men. And I thought that you were, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just holding on like, for dear right. life. I'm like, you are a madman, but I love you again. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Um, just the boys. I thought you were there for moral yeah. support. Yeah, no, just you the were boys. Just, no, I'm not that bad. You were just pushing stuff. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, so, you're on to me. So we, we get there and none of this was a huge surprise because I already knew them very well. But it was the first time that there was no mics, no cameras, no, um, <laughs> no management team, no adults. I mean, I was the adult, which is wild. <laughs> I turned to Caitlin at one point. I'm like, you know, we're like mom and dad here, I mean, which is, that seems wholly inappropriate. Um, and we said to the guys like, look, you're here to have fun. We're not here to be your parents. We're not here to be authority figures. Just enjoy yourselves and just be respectful and have a good time. And the truth is, we went out to dinner, we, would spend, we went to day clubs, we went to lunches, we went to, and I got 
an even deeper understanding of who these men are and were. And it was a further reinforcement that we're on the right path, that Phil is picking the right kind of person. And it was great to have Ben specifically, Ben Foster, because he's the one that's been through it all. And he just keeps pulling us aside and saying, you're doing this the right way from a player's perspective. You're building the right kind of locker room. Again, we're not doing this, this is Phil. And Phil's whole thing is chemistry, chemistry, chemistry. We have to, we have to build the right locker room and just no jerks. He, he uses a different phrase, but it's no <laughs> something. How has this experience of being a sports owner, this experience of being in, Ra uh, this experience of being in Wales, this experience of, uh, of communing with the local Wrexham fan base, with this new global Wrexham fan base, with Ryan, how has that changed you as a human being? What lesson have you learned? Well, there's something very strange about making a documentary. Um, because people assume that, oh, you're on camera, so you're used to it. But I'm not <laughs> used to it. I'm used to um, either being, either having a script and playing a different character, and then always getting to say, well, that's not really me. That's just the character I'm playing. Or it's maybe an interview type thing where, where we're answering questions. And yes, this is the real me. But it's not then following me and catching me in certain moments that I'm un unprepared for or ill-prepared for. And so it was fascinating to watch back so much of the footage that had been shot and then realizing <laughs> that I still had the power to say, don't put that in, don't put that in, don't put that in, but that it would feel dishonest and people that watched it would realize that it was manufactured and not what was really happening. So there are moments that I am like embarrassed about that I put out into the world where I seem or am being impetuous or childish um, when it comes to certain things like bureaucracy and like navigating certain things. And that's embarrassing, <laughs> and yet it's, I recognize it's also funny. And one, uh, first of all, one of the greatest expressions that I've heard, uh, my, my, I think my, maybe my favorite UK expression, is whinging, which I'd never heard about, never heard before. And so many people saying, oh my god, look, listen to this guy whinge. It's so true. I, I, like throughout the first season, I'm whinging so much <laughs> about this or that or this, and it's just bitching, it's just complaining. But, for me, the reason it was important to put it up there was that it was an accurate representation of who I am. And it also forced me to reconcile that, you know, sometimes that kind of assertive behavior can get you what you need, and sometimes you need it, and sometimes you need to push through certain levels of bureaucracy. But if it starts to get into layers of like aggressiveness or childlike behavior uh, or, or even disrespectful disregard for other people's feelings, then you really are doing everybody a disservice. And to have that laid bare for me was really helpful because I realized like, oh, I have to take a second look at how I approach things. So I've kind of like <laughs> even looked at the whole second season of the documentary my entire life and said, wow, how can I use this as an opportunity to be a better person? Rob. First of all, nice shirt. Thanks. Second of all, you're a beautiful human being. To your team, to your family, to your town, both of them, up the turf. Let's do that again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is uh, truly an honor. Listen to the full version of this podcast and all our podcasts wherever you get your pods. But first, subscribe here for more Men in Blazers videos and courage. It's like this was